Hello, everybody. Um, wishing you a happy afternoon from the East Coast. Um, I am thinking about all of you over on the West Coast and uh, the situation that you are finding you in, find yourself in. Um, and if you uh, do observe Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, um, I wish for you and for all of us, may the, the coming year be a lot clearer for us in, in many, many ways. So today we are going to talk about two different prayers. So I want to just kind of lay out what we'll be doing uh, in today's class. Today we will begin with the Aleinu prayer. And again, I'm choosing Aleinu because it is very, very common in most services of both uh, denominational and non-denominational communities. The Aleinu is recited at the end of the service. So we're going to start with that. And then the next piece we're going to do is specifically for Yom Kippur, uh, the Ashamnu, when we you know, hit our chests as we say different, different words. Um, so those are the texts that we'll be covering. Then in terms of uh, grammar, uh, I'm going to start showing you a little bit about how nouns work and the supplementary material for this week will actually have you uh, translating different nouns in different forms. And I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, my other request, and Julie, don't kill me for, uh, for doing this, is for our last week, next week, if there is a prayer or a blessing that you've really been hoping that I would cover, which we have not covered yet. If you could put that into the chat, and then if we get a few overwhelming requests, um, I will uh, I will choose choose those. So absolutely, I'll save those. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, as usual, I am going to share my screen uh, with a PowerPoint. When we talk about the Aleinu, we're not gonna cover a lot of grammar. We'll get to more of the grammar when we come to Ashamnu. All right, so let's get our PowerPoint up. And full screen. Okay, so the first text that we are looking at uh, today, I have not put the entire Aleinu prayer up. I have put the beginning that most communities um, recite aloud or sing together, and then the last line when everyone kind of comes back from the silent mumbling or reading to uh, oneself um, and the community comes back again. Um, so I'd like to read through this and translate it for you, and then um, offer an alternative to the traditional Aleinu that I believe more and more communities are beginning to use. So we begin with Aleinu l'shabeach la'adon hakol. So what does this mean? Aleinu is the preposition al, plus new, us. So it is upon us, Aleinu, Lishabeach, to give praise, La Adon Hakol, to the master or lord of Kol, we've had, of everything. Then Latet Gedula. So here we're continuing on what it is that is upon us, continuing Aleinu, then Latet, to give, Gidula, Gadol means big or great, so to give like greatness, um, and, and, and with that word you could choose a lot of different English synonyms, 
le yotzer bereshit to the fashioner um, uh, of the beginning. So a reference back to creation. Now, the next few clauses are all going to begin with she-lo. So they're all going to begin with this low, with this negative about not. And um, basically, the, the theme, it will be stated in several different ways, but the basic idea of each of these clauses is going to be, why are we praising God? Because God has not made us like other people. So these clauses are going to emphasize very much this idea of, of the Jewish people as not just unique, but really separate from all other peoples. And it's going to just say this over and over again in a number of different ways. So I will go through. So beginning with Shelo Asanu Kegoye Haaratzot. So She, it means who. Sometimes you'll see it written fuller as Asher. Asher and She mean the same thing. So, who has not asanu, made us, here's our preposition, k, like goye ha'aratzot, the nations of the world. All right? So, God who has not made us like the nations of the world. And then the next, lo, velo samanu, Ke mishpechot ha'adama, and who has not placed us, ke mishpechot, like the families, ha'adama, of the world. Adama is literally ground soil, but it can also have a more expansive meaning. Continuing the same theme now, shelo, who has not, some, placed chelkeinu kahem. A chelek is a portion. So who has not uh, set or placed um, our portion like their portion. And then the last one, vigoraleinu kechol hamonam. And goral is fate and our fate like all of the uh, multitudes. Okay. So again, when from beginning with Shelo Asanu, all the way through until we get to the Va'anachnu Korim, the beginning of the bowing, we're basically getting the same idea that's been re that's being repeated in a number of ways about um, Israel being a separate chosen people whose fate, whose purpose is different from those, uh, from all other nations and peoples and families of the earth. Then we move to the part where, for those of you who are familiar, this is when we begin then to bend our knees and bow down a little bit. So, va'anachnu, we, korim, we bend, Umishtachavim, and we bow down. Umodim, and we thank, give thanks. Lifne Melech, Malche, Hamlachim. Three king things here Melech, Malche, Hamlachim. So we are bending, bowing down, and giving thanks before the king of the kings of kings. So the idea of kingship is emphasized very, very much so in Aleinu, um, continuing with the part that's not included here that people recite um, uh, usually on their own. The idea of God as king and God as the one who created the world, the God from the beginning of time is an important theme in Aleinu. And then finished with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed is He. 
And then we all usually come together. etc., etc. So Emar, the Shoresh here is Amar, Aleph Memresh. Amar means say or speak. So Ne'emar, as it is said, Vahaya Adonai Lamelech al Kol Haaretz. Adonai will be king over all of the world. Bayom Hahu on or in our preposition Yom day. So um, so on or in that day. Yihye Adonai Echad. Adonai will be Yihye Echad one. Ushemo and his Shem, his name, it will be one. Okay. Now there are um, there are people who are quite comfortable with the Alenu as it is traditionally um, written, and uh, and feel that the idea of Israel as a separate and unique people with a unique purpose is, um, is a central part of Judaism. And there are those who feel uncomfortable with this kind of language. And one of the great things about being a Jew is that there are a multiplicity of ways to identify, to, to identify as Jewish, to practice Judaism, to pray, um, and, uh, and, and so there's no one way that's ever determined about doing anything. And so here is an alternative. Um, this has been incorporated into the Reconstructionist movement, Sidur, uh, I'm sorry about that. I had to cut and paste pictures to, to get this from the Sidur. So one alternative begins the same way. Aleinu l'shabeach la'adon hakol. It is upon us to give thanks to the Lord of all. Latet gedula le'yotzer bereshit. To give greatness to the creator uh, of the beginnings of time. And then in place of going to the shello, who did not, who did not, who did not, all of that is substituted with venatan lanu torat emet. Who has natan, who has given lanu, our preposition, we've talked about this form before, so has, who has given to us Torah emet, and we've seen this phrase before, a Torah of truth. Vechaye olam nata betocheinu, and who has planted chaye olam, um, eternal life, metaphorically speaking, be in tochenu, in our midst, within us. In other words, the idea here is to express the idea of, uh, of the Jewish people being special without denigrating others or without saying we are the best, but rather this, our unique relationship with God is based on the gift of Torah and everything that comes with it and that sustains us. So this is one alternative. Other communities are writing their own alternatives um, and many use the, I think most, most Jews, I think in the United States, use the traditional language, which is just fine if you are comfortable with that. Okay, so that is the Aleinu again. Um, this usually closes off services, whether we're talking about uh, weekday services or Shabbat services, uh, on Chagim as well. 
the one thing that will be different on the high holidays is that there is an extra Alenu that is added into the liturgy in which, and this is the one time of year where people actually get up and instead of just kind of bowing down a little bit and then lifting the head, people actually go all the way down onto the floor at the synagogue and prostrate themselves and then come back up. And so this is the one time of year when Jews actually fully bow before God the King. So if you have seen this in your communities, that is what's going on. Except there's always the, the trouble of finding room to actually do the whole thing. Okay, now, um, now I'd like to move on to uh, something special for the High Holidays the Ashamnu prayer. So the Ashamnu prayer is part of a larger category called the Vidui. Vidui means confession. So the Ashamnu prayer is one of the confessional prayers. It is not the only one. Uh, for those of you who may recall um, there, several times during the, during the High Holidays, we say, al chet shechatanu, for the sin that we have sinned, and then by doing X, Y, Z. And then again, al chet shechatanu, for the sin that we have sinned, and again, another thing. And it goes on and on and on and on and on with a long list. That is also vidui, that is also a confessional prayer, and that is considered the long uh, the long uh, confessional prayer, and Ashamu is considered the, uh, the shorter confessional prayer. Um, confession is not a, uh, a big deal in Judaism, so this is really the one time of the year in which we, um, in which we clearly kind of like state our, our weaknesses, our mistakes, our wrong behavior, and then uh, uh, plea to God for understanding and forgiveness. Now, one other thing about the Ashamnu before we get into the text is that in more traditional communities where the full liturgy is recited, the full kind of traditional liturgy where things are not shortened, where pieces are not cut out, the Ashamu actually appears in everyday prayer. It's not just Yom Kippur, but it is said as a part of the service that, um, uh, that I think many communities um, have cut out, which is called the Tachanun, part of a service. Tachanun um, um, means um, uh, kind of like a, asking for, for grace and, and kind of like a repentance, remorse. And so in more traditional communities, this is not just associated with Yom Kippur, but with daily prayer. Um, on Yom Kippur, we recite it aloud together in community. In daily prayer, it's recited silently. All right, so let's see what we have here. So we begin with... Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, Dibarnu, Dofi. Now, as we continue to read, almost every single word here is a verb that's going to end in nu, meaning we have done X, we have done Y, we have done Z. The only, I think it's three, four words that are not nouns are dofi. So dibarnu dofi, we have spoken kind of like foolishness. Then sheker means lie. Ra means uh, evil. And kishinu oref uh, is kind of like headstrong. But otherwise, these are all a list of verbs. And I want to point out a couple of things about this, which will move us into grammar. If you look at each of the verbs, 
you may notice something interesting about them. So I'll give you just a moment to look. Obviously, I have highlighted the first letter of each verb in this list of wrongdoings. For those of you who are familiar with the Hebrew alphabet, you may notice that this prayer is an acrostic, right? An acrostic, which means that the prayer is organized uh, via the Hebrew alphabet. So that our first word, ashamnu, begins with an aleph. Our next word, bagadnu, bet, then gimel, then dalid. And going through the entire alphabet, you'll notice on the shin that they do not provide a shin and then a sin. Because often shin and sin are just kind of put together. And then the whole thing ends with the final letter of the alphabet repeated three times for the last three verbs. So why create something as an acrostic? Well, I think that there are um, uh, pragmatic reasons and then also more kind of mystical spiritual reasons. In terms of practical reasons, it becomes easier to memorize something if it's put in this acrostic form where it can help you remember by going through knowing, okay, I have an aleph word, then a bet word, then a gimel word, and it can help with memorization. Another um, common prayer that uses the same system is the ashrei. Ashrei yoshrei vetecha, od yihalucha, selah. And then each line that comes after begins with aleph and then bets and keeps, and keeps going on. Okay. Now, I think the, another reason besides just helping to remember a prayer like this is that there is something that is expressed by, um, by having every letter of the alphabet. It's almost as if we're expressing in our recitation of this, God, we have messed up in every way from A to Z that right that the totality of our language is you know it, it expresses all of our uh all of our weaknesses and shortcomings okay. now one thing i'm not going to do today and i know it's different than what we usually do is i am not going to go through and translate each of these words why because the vast majority of these words are very rare verbs that you are not likely to come across anywhere else. Okay, there are a few here that are somewhat common, but most of these really don't appear in other places. If you can remember that every time you're reciting one of these verbs, you're basically saying something like, we have erred, we have um, um, uh, lied, we have exploited, we have been lazy, we have been, you know, uh, um, uh, stubborn, we have been destructive. So, you know, you can just kind of put anything like that into your mind and it's contained in, in these different verbs. Okay. Now, a little piece of grammar for today. So we're here, we're still in the ashamnu. And as I said before, the ashamnu is almost completely a list of verbs. Now, not every verb follows the same form in Hebrew. But again, I'd like you to take a moment to look at the verbs that I have highlighted and see if you can find patterns with these verbs that I've highlighted. So one of the things that you might notice is that the vowel pattern is the same for all of these verbs. 
So for example, Ba God Nu. Under the first letter, we have a kamats, the little T. Under the second letter, we have a patach. And then a shva, and then nu is added. And you can see it's the same thing with all of these highlighted verbs. That we have three letters that make up the root, the shoresh of the word. And then this same vowel pattern, the most important part to remember, to recognize about this, is the kamats and the patach. It's a, ah, a, ah, but two different, uh, two different vowels. Okay, so what do we have here? This form, when you have the letters of the root and you have this particular vowel pattern, is the most basic verbal form in Hebrew that expresses the past tense. And the new is the suffix that is attached to the shoresh, to the root, to indicate that it's we. So we have done something. Ba God knew, we have acted treacherously. Asham knew, we have sinned. And so this basic form you can apply to other verbs. All right, I will um, uh, upload this material uh, onto our supplementary site with exercises so that you can look at this more carefully and try to get these patterns into your head. Just one quick note, the small vertical line that you see on these is not a part of the verb form. This happens to be um, marking the stress of the word. And depending on the sidur that you use, it may or may not be included. This is something that editors, that, that modern editors uh, choose to add or not add. So, you know, disregard the, the small vertical line in terms of recognizing the pattern. All right, so here we go. Our first verb paradigm. So again, I want to remind us all we are in the past tense. So the basic past tense of the most basic verb form in Hebrew will give you the three letters of the Shoresh and then this verb pattern, kamatz patach. You don't have to remember what these are called, but you wanna get used to seeing these. And if you see these two together, you can say, oh, I'm likely in a past tense verb. So the basic with no extra suffixes added means he. So pasha is he sinned. So the third masculine singular, which is by far the most common form in Tanakh, in the Bible, and in Sidur, and in rabbinic literature, is going to be the third masculine singular, he, pasha. Now, if we want to make it plural, and instead of saying he, we want to make a whole bunch of he's and she's, and we want to say they, then we take the same pattern, but we add u at the end. Now, pash u. So when you see the u at the end, now we have changed it from he sinned to they sinned. You may notice that this patach has reduced down into a shva. You don't have to worry uh, about getting into the rules of, of why that is so at this stage. Now, what if I want to take the basic same shoresh, my basic root in the past tense, but I want to say I did something. Again, I'm going to take my basic form, 
the Kamas and the Patach, and I'm going to add Taf Chirik Yud, T, to the end. So Pashati makes it I sinned. And then if we want to make it we, and this is what we have in the Ashamnu, and what we see most often in our prayers, we take our Pasha and add Nu. And that makes it we sinned. So the, the, the past tense in Hebrew, and this is the same in modern Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, in rabbinic Hebrew, this is consistent throughout all Hebrews, is that you, um, you add suffixes to mark the person. I haven't given you the full paradigm, so I have not included how we would say she sinned or you sinned masculine, you sinned feminine, and y'all sinned. We're starting, all right, starting with the basics, right? So it's not to overwhelm. But again, uh, the past tense is going to be built up at the end after the root. We won't really have a chance to engage, but the future tense is going to be built up by adding prefixes in front. So one final step in this, you know, here's another example. The word amar, very, very common, means say. So amar, again, with the same vowel pattern and no, no suffixes added on will be he said. Amru, adding u becomes they said. Amarti makes it I said. And finally, Amarnu, with the nu, makes it we said. Once you know the basic root of a verb, you can actually begin to add these yourself to communicate. And if you're interested in modern Hebrew, if you know the basic root of something and you want to say, I did that thing, just add T to the end. All right, our last step for today. The only thing I am now adding are, well, how do you say the word he? How do you say they? How do you say I? And how do you say we? So who means he. So you can say who Amar, and now you have a, a, a small incomplete sentence, who Amar, he said. We know that Amru is going to signify they, and the word for they is Haim, Haim Amru, they said. The word for I is Ani, Ani Amarti, I said. And finally, for we, the word is anachnu. And we have seen this word in some of the prayers that we've covered, anachnu amarnu. When you're speaking in Hebrew, most speakers will not put I or we. You don't need it because it's already implied by the suffix. Right, so if you have Amar Nu, this Nu already tells us it's we. So you can say Anach Nu Amar Nu, but an Israeli will, will know that you're an American and that you're giving a little more than you need to, right? It's not technically incorrect, but it's a little bit superfluous. Okay, so again, what we have introduced for this week's class uh, in addition to the two prayers, are the beginning of what the past tense looks like for the he, they, I, and we.
Okay. What I am um, adding into the exercises for this week, in addition to the recordings of the prayers at different speeds, in addition to, um, to this PowerPoint, I am uh, also going to give you a few very, very common verbs. And I'm going to put different suffixes on there and ask you to translate them. And then if you want to put more time into it, then you can try thinking, okay, if I have a mar about saying, and then try to look, you know, not depend on looking at the text, how would I say I said? Amarti. How would I say we said? Amarnu. And it may be helpful for you, depending on the kind of learner you are, to actually say these out loud so that you're using oral expression to help you kind of take in these forms. So that is our basic lesson for today. Um, I am happy to give you fuller paradigms uh, but again, I wanted to just start with four forms. Um, I think that learning incrementally uh, becomes a little bit easier and uh, learning four is much, much easier than learning eight. Not just half as easy, but I think 70% easier because you're not overwhelmed. All right. So with that, if there are any questions. Uh, there is one question in the chat box. Um, the vowel seems to change from he to they. Yes, yes. So the vowels will sometimes change. When you add suffixes onto a word, you're basically messing with the stressed syllable. So if I say Amar, he said, my stress is on Mar, the second syllable, Amar. But as soon as I say we said, uh, no, as soon as I say they said, Amru, now my stress is on U. So because of the shifts in the stress, some vowels will change. And without getting into all the technical issues, it's basically the idea that, um, that vowels tend to get a little bit shorter as they move away from the stressed syllable. So the patach, the little line, if it's no longer on the stressed syllable, will reduce, will shorten to just a schwa sound. So that it's usually because of stress when you see slight changes to the vowel patterns. 